Feet village, it's a Syrian village which was damaged after the Israeli occupation in 67. I think it was about 1000 inhabitation now. Here, inhibit, inhabitant now they are live as a refugee in Damascus and near Damascus. You see the damaged houses. This village is not as the same Syrian village was, was, which was damaged at all. But the, the Israelis leave the houses of this village not to leave him, but to uh, make military training on the houses how to capture uh, Syrian or Arab villages. How the, the, the natural is be beautiful. I think it will be more beautiful when her uh, people return back and rebuild it from rebuild it. Uh, it's very difficult to see damaged uh, villages. It's very difficult also to see villages without people. But I think it's the, the, the it's the dewing of the Israeli occupation.
My name is Taysir Maria. I'm the general director of an organization called Golan for Development. Uh, we are a non-profit organization that working in Golan Heights in order to support uh, our people here under the Israeli occupation. So we are involved in lots of different activities like uh, uh, health activities. We provide all the health services, most of the health services. We provide to the population here. We have also projects in music and theater and women issues, in agriculture, tourism. Basically, we take care of lots of uh, different uh, uh, projects in, in the area. Our attitude, our philosophy is uh, by making um, these developmental projects, we will strengthen our uh, society. And in this way, we, we increase the awareness of people to, to, any, to lots of different things, and this also, we believe that it will keep the struggle against the Israeli occupation. شو رباب زين انت غيرت بعدين نشتغل الصبح بس نشتغل بعدين سلام ما كيف حالكم؟ ايه also this is our emergency room that uh, we are the only emergency clinic in the north an emergency care that happens in this area we bring them here uh, we have the possibility to treat uh, two cases at the same time uh, but also, I mean, in, in the um, uh, uh, next day when the Palestinians came from uh, uh, from Syria to Majd al Shams to Gulan, uh, so we uh, we were the only uh, clinic that gave them the medical treatment, and we went to the ceasefire line and sub and uh, treated them there. But I mean, that was quite a big thing. Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Basically. Uh, so what hap what happened? Uh, it was really a surprise for all of us. I mean, they came and they managed to cross the ceasefire line to go via all these uh, minefields, and they ended up in the center of the village, and uh, Israelis started shooting at them. Uh, five people were killed, two on this side and three on the other side, and about 30 were, uh, were uh, wounded. So we provide all the health uh, treatment for these people, and... As I said, that people, about 200 uh, uh, Syrians and Palestinians uh, were in the center of the village. Then the army wanted to attack the village, and we said that uh, we are not going to let uh, such a thing happen, and we are going to protect these people, because they were completely civilians with, with no uh, uh, arm, uh, with, with no weapon. And after a few hours of negotiation between us and the army, there was some kind of agreement that uh, we asked the army to give a safe path back to these people and uh, we will convince them to go back. And really, we managed to talk to these people, to the Palestinians and the Syrians, and convince them to go back. And uh, in this way, we saved them from being killed uh, by, by the Israelis. These people went back uh, to, to their refugee camps in, in Syria. But what happened after... Uh, in, after, in, in the next day, uh, also they want to come, but at that time the Israelis were prepared, and everyone that tried to cross the Israelis uh, shoot and killed. And about uh, 30 people were killed that day, in the next day, and about 300 were wounded. These people, I mean, they didn't bring, they didn't um, uh, risk any of the Israeli soldiers, because they were about 300 meters away. They couldn't, uh, even if they want to throw stones, they couldn't reach the Israelis. 
and there was lots of fences, and the Israelis killed them with no good reason because, as I said, they, they didn't bring any any uh, risk for the Israelis, and they were killing them just uh, for the sake of killing. Uh, these people were, were not able to cross, but the Israelis, as I said, because they tried to cross, the Israelis uh, killed them. شو عم يعمل لك شيء مشاكل اللي طلعت؟ تلفنت على التليفون مرتين، ما ردوش علي. فتح من الحيلة وجيت لهون. قطعت لي الرقم هذا 45. ايه ولا اسعى بقول لي ما بعرف شكون وحده بحت قدامي. طيب كيف هذا؟ تأخرت شو مسوي لك؟ لا مش تأخرت يعني مش أنا تأخرت. أي شيء هذا؟ يعني عنده لسه قطع لي وحده قدامي. بس كيف ليه؟ بس هو زلمة كان عنده الحيلة طورة شو بيسوي؟ أي أهم اللي يلضح الدورة أو يرد على التليفون؟ كويس أنا شو يقول عليه مستعجل يعني؟ مستعجل أي في الموقع بدي روح على الموقع يلا شو؟ إذا حدا بيبديك في الموقع بدنا نروح على الموقع يلا إن شاء الله خير خمس دقائق عشر دقائق عندي الدواء بدي أطلع إيه كمانتي عندي عندي عدد يعني بدك تطول بالك علينا عادة تاريخيا كل قرية عربية أو كل تجمع سكاني بشري كان حول نبع ماء وهنا هذه القرية السورية المحتلة عن فيتر احتلت عام 1967 ودمرها الاحتلال هذه هي الق... هذا هو نبع الماء الذي عندما أتوا سكان القرية لي... لي... ليستوطنوا هنا تجمعوا حول هذا الب... حول هذا النبع لكي يرتووا منهم ومواشيهم والى اخره هذا النبع الان نحن بفصل الشتاء نراه قويا نسبيا لكن بفصل الصيف يخف لدرجه انه بالكاد كان يكفي سكان القريه فقط للشفه للماء الشرب كما يعني يعني يسموها ماء الشفه وبعض المواشي ربما لا أكثر من هذا لا لم يكن يستعمل الزراعة حسب تقديري فقط لإرواء البنادمين والمواشي الأرض ملكية عامة الأرض ملكية لأصحابها لأهل القرية والماء ملكية عامة لكل الناس لكل السكان This is grapefruit. The old orchard was a uh, sweetie. It's between uh, grapefruit and the uh, and the uh, uh, pomelo. It's it's between. So we leave some uh, trees only for home use, not not for commercial use. find here some fruits but most of the trees are without any mangoes this year I mean this kind of uh, mango because there are some variety there are some other varieties that uh, the production is much much better this year last year it was terrific so you can see the small mango it will be about like this about uh, now it's about 50 gram it will be uh, while harvesting about uh, 300 uh, grams so it will be bigger and when it uh, be ready to eat it will be red it's very very nice the test is very very nice
So you live here in the, the Golan Heights. Can you say a little bit about what you told me before about how you came here? Yeah. And We came here on 1978. Uh, we educated in the Techno in Haifa. Me as a civil engineering, Mira is my wife as a chemist. And we came in, we make a big change in our life. We put all our education on the side and we start as agricultural people to, from the beginning. I became back to the university only after 25 years and quite different uh, subject. I uh, studies uh, um, uh, uh, what we call Eretz Israel studies, uh, Israeli studies, MA, uh, PhD in Haifa University. And now I try to combine the work as an agricultural man and my research. Uh, regarding the history of the uh, political story of Israel or the Golan Heights, if you want. Basically, this lake is uh, the only natural lake in, in, in the area. Two years ago, it was completely dried by the Israelis, and it was the first time in, in history that this lake was almost dry. And all the fish was, were killed, and uh, the young people, they make big demonstration against that, that the Israelis uh, destroying the env environment, and uh, uh, also because of this demonstration of the young people and we went there and we put water everyone went with the uh, small bottle of water and put it in this lake just uh, uh, why was it dried up because they use it for agriculture because it, we didn't have enough rain and all the water was given to the for the agriculture so they uh, usually they don't uh, pump all the water they keep some some of this water uh, Anyway, I mean, from this lake, I mean, half of it is given to the people of Golan, which is about uh, th three million cubic meters. So we are about twenty thousand people, twenty-one thousand people getting the water from this uh, from this lake because it's one of the main resources. We still have one resource, which is uh, this is Majd al Shams, basically on this side. Uh, this is the unoccupied side, which is inside Syria. So some of our water is coming from this from this area basically, and it's it's um, from the Syrian side, and it's flowing to to uh, uh, to our apples. So all this area, we which is about uh, uh, two thousand uh, donums, it gets the water from the other side of the ceasefire line, from the Syrian side. All the farmers of all these cooperatives, people have to make all the systems. In, inside uh, our uh, land, usually the authority have to make the main uh, uh, lines to, to, to the farmers. Uh, and, uh, but here, I mean, we, we have to invest and we have about 20 cooperatives in Gulan. Each one invested some like one till two million dollars to make the, the irrigation systems, uh, which is lots of money. Not only this, we have, we have also to pump the water uh, from the lake to our to our apples, because we have the the apples and and small hills and terraces, uh, which is also costs us lots of money. Just to make the long story short, we end up paying about one dollar for one cubic meter. While if we move uh, just three kilometers away from uh, from my village, you find settlers uh, that they pay less than uh, thirty cents for one cubic meters because they. They, uh, the authority will pump the water for them, they get subsidies for the water, and they have access to, to, to the water that they, that they need. Also, they, they take more than 700 cubic meters for 1,000 square meter of, of apples, for one dunum of apples, while the, settle, the, the people of Gulan, till now we don't get them more than 200 uh, cubic meters for one, one, one dunum, which means also the, the settlers take something like uh, four times more than when, what, what we take, and they pay uh, less money for, for the same amount of, of water. As I told you, we have about 18,000 settlers in Gulan. Uh, they, surely they control most of the land of Gulan. Uh, they have more than uh, uh, 80,000 donums that they uh, uh, cultivate. 
and they get about 34 million cubic meters every year. This is the amount of water that we get. The Arabs now in Golan, we are about 21,000. We cultivate uh, about 20,000 uh, dunams, and we get only 4 million cubic meters of, of uh, uh, water for irrigation. In the 70s and 80s, we, we didn't get any water from the uh, from this lake, and in the summer it's too dry. So people really didn't manage to grow our apples. So what the people invented, they started to build these water tanks. Uh, basically in 84, 82, 84 we started. Till 1986 we built about 600 water tanks. Uh, these water tanks we used to keep the raining water in the, in the winter time and uh, use it for irrigation in, in the summer. Uh, in 1986, there was a, the Israelis were very angry and they didn't know what to do with these uh, water tanks. And they created a special committee from the Israeli parliament to discuss the issue of water in Golan Heights. And after a few uh, months of discussion, they came with the new regulations. And they said, you cannot just build a water tank, you have to get uh, five different permits to build the water tank. Surely the army was one of these authorities that you have to get permit, the Natural Protection Authority, Planning Authority, uh, Archaeological Authority, and the National Water uh, Authority in Israel. So practically since that time, I mean, no one can get these five permits, so we cannot get, uh, we cannot build any more, uh, any of these uh, water tanks. And what was funny, in the beginning of the 90s, they sent letters to every farmer to put water meter, to measure how much rain we use, and they wanted us to pay some kind of taxes, taxation, for for this water, claiming that uh, the water that falls over Israel, including Golan Heights, is, is owned by the state. Even if you use this water, you have to pay some of uh, to, to pay some taxes for for the government. Practically, people didn't pay, but till now, I mean, we face this problem because every time that we discuss about the uh, our uh, quota and water in Gulan, I mean, all the time they say that you have these water tanks and you have to pay for us, and, uh, but we were refused and we don't pay any, any taxation for this. But now, I mean, they don't exist almost, most of them they were destroyed or, because, I mean, it's not so uh, brilliant uh, idea, but at least it shows the need of, of the water for people and how they really were uh, insisted to, to get their, uh, uh, their, their water. Okay. When I went to the university, I studied, surely everything is in Hebrew, so you have to communicate, and, uh, which, is, uh, which is very good. I mean, we, uh, I mean, the Hebrew language is very close also to the Arabic language. We have lots of, of things in common, the same logic uh, of the language. Uh, but also in the, in the school, we had to study all the Zionist uh, history and literature and uh, 
all these Zionist writers, what they wrote about the land of Zion in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, we have to study uh, the Jewish Tanakh also in our schools. Also, history, geography is, is taught in uh, a very political uh, uh, frame. I mean, they are trying to teach us that uh, uh, Israel is the only democracy, and surely I mean, that Golan is not Syrian land, and it was, it was liberated from the Arab control. And uh, this is what I mean. The line is to make really to make a complete brainwashing for the new generation, and to try to create complete uh, uh, a new generation which is completely ignorant to its heritage and its history. And, uh, so, how does that make you feel? When you well, go, uh, when you, when you, when you study that, I mean, it's no. I mean, frankly, it's it's quite interesting. I mean, to study the culture and religion and and history of others, which I'm not against. I mean, but uh, what's funny, I mean, that you study the culture and history of others before you study your own history, and when they teach about the Arab history, they teach it one-sided. For example, all the poetry in the Arab uh, history for the Israelis, it's all, only about women about love, about nature, there is no political poetry or literature. <laughs> because they know, I mean, if, if they teach any political aspects of that, so next morning people will reflect about their situation and they will start to understand that this is where facing Israeli occupation. So everything that, I mean, they are trying to, uh, and surely they are trying to divide us to, uh, to different uh, religious groups and things like that. I mean, uh, you know that uh, the, uh, the Arabs, most of the Arabs that remain in Golan, they are Jews, which is part of the Islam. I mean, we are within the frame of the Islam. I mean, if we are Muslims, not Muslim, things like that, I mean, it's more theological discussion. But I mean, to put the Jews in political frame as if we are really a political minority or, uh, or we are uh, non-Arabs or non-Syrian, things like that, I mean, this is what they are trying to teach us in, in our uh, schools. I mean, they created special uh, curricula for Druze. We they created so-called the Druze heritage, as if it's different than the Arab heritage. I mean, when you come to study all these things and uh, really you start to see how the Israeli system is trying to work and trying to uh, deny the realities. From one side, I mean, you feel uh, strong because it's not working because it's big lies, and really start to feel how much the Israelis, even they think that they are so clever, but they are stupid at the same time, because, you know, when you believe uh, in power and only in power, I think you, sh you cannot be clever and believe only in power, because it's, it's important that you find the bridges between you and other people, other nations, your neighbors, else I think that, and if you come and see the reality of the Israelis, all the time, I mean, they feel that they are surrounded by enemies and things like that. I mean, it's also they have the feeling that the Jews are hated by all the people all over the world, which is not true. Uh, but one, once it was in the Israeli TV, I mean, the question is, if people hate, all the people hate you. So the question is not only why the, you should ask what I did to make others uh, hate me. I mean, it's not enough to blame others. I think that... Uh, uh, you should look at yourself and I think in, via your behavior, your beliefs, your, your philosophy in life, you can understand why people love you or, or hate you. I think it's not, I mean, it's to take responsibility of your activity and not to throw it on, on, on the shoulders of other, of other people or other individuals. So, uh, what, what all the time I like to say, you love me, I love you. But you hate me, I love you. Not because I'm... Which means love it should be part of, of, your, of your values. I'm not reacting. If you don't like me, I will not like you. It's not like this. I mean, if I like you, I like you because this is my, my beliefs, not because you are nice or you are not nice. So again, I mean, I think that the Israelis all the time have this uh, uh, phobia. On the beginning, we located on a temporary place nearby. Here it was absolutely nothing. You can see the, the ice trees. We planted everything from the beginning. 
we, my neighbor, for example, this tree. And little by little we develop the land, we make the profit from the land, and we have the peaceful from the, this place. It's not only a, a job, it's, it's been much more, much more than a job and much more than home. It's a community, it's a, it's, a, it's a style of life, it's a way of life. The water was an issue in, in between Israel and Syria because the water line, the Jordan and the lake, it was located in between Syria and Israel. So it was an issue, but it could be solved by a political solution. But the subject of the water from the psychological aspect uh, uh, was in between Syria and Israel to reach a peace agreement because of the emotion, because of the, the psychological aspect the, the disagreement between Syria and Israel how, 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 uh, about 10 meters or 100 meters from the east of the lake was between Syria and Israel to reach a peace agreement and not all the in the old front, but only in a very, very narrow strip, 12 kilometer on the northeast of the lake. That's all. And so why did it fail? Because, what I try to say, gap between memories and history. The, uh, who will control the uh, north, in, on the northeast section of the lake? Who will control it? Israel or Syria? The, uh, the psychological aspect of the lake, what we call the Kinneret, the Sea of Galilee, for the public of, uh, in Israel is very, very important. So to say that we let Syria to, to control it, it's unacceptable. On the opposite side is Syria. So it could be solved, as a, in peace situation, it could be solved. But the leaders could not uh, bridge the gap between the memories and the history. And so for you, you live here, uh, how, how do you see the future or how do you, do you think about it or...? Uh. Mm, from, it is a conflict, inner conflict, from my point of view, me, uh, between my personal point of view and my, let's say, the point of view of the nation. From my personal point of view, as you can imagine, for me, here is a... Uh, it's a paradise, it's, a, it's everything. But I think from the uh, nation point of view, it is the interest of Israel to reach a peace agreement between Syria and Israel. I'm not sure, is, to say it now, it's, a, it's a, something abstract. Uh, nobody can think about it because we don't have a panther to, to speak about it. But we had it on the past, and peace agreement for Israel, it is the interest of Israel because it's been stability, and, uh, and it is not. There was a good reason why all the prime ministers in Israel, when it was an option, they tried to find such a peace agreement. And a peace agreement means bring the Golan eyes to Syria because it's Syrian territory. We keep it because there is no peace. But in the situation of peace should be a, a part of uh, Syria, okay. but peace will be maybe next year, maybe in, uh, the, on the next generation, nobody knows when, so we are here. But when there is peace, what will happen to you? I don't know, I don't think about it, it is not realistic, and I don't think about it because it is not realistic, I don't think about it because if you think what, if you try to think what will be in the future, we, we are, when you will not be here, you cannot stay here anymore. You have, if you would like to, to save your a normal life, you have to think you are here forever. If something will change, we will think about it. It's not uh, so nice to wake up uh, in the morning and see the fence in front of your bedroom. Uh, you know, when you see it all the time, you remember the occupation, you remember the, that you are away from your country, from your family. 
you know, my family was separated in 1967. Three of my brothers stayed on the other side. I didn't have the chance to see them since 1967. Uh, basically, the Israelis claim that it's their security and it's not allowed. And, uh, but I don't think that it's a question of security, a question of uh, violating our rights and uh, it's some kind of collective punishment for our people because we don't agree with the Israeli policy and we don't ac accept the Israeli occupation. So one of the ways I mean, to, uh, to punish people is to prevent us from uh, going to, uh, to Syria. Even all the international conventions and agreements give the rights for people under occupation to go to visit their country. I mean, it's, it's the normal thing. The unnormal thing that uh, we were not uh, allowed. And if you look, for example, in the West Bank and Gaza, I mean, since 1967, Palestinians can go to the Arab countries, which is not their, their own country, while the Syrians in, Go in Golan Heights, we were denied our rights to, our right to go to, to visit our country and to visit our families. So lots of the families in Golan, they were separated since 1967. And basically, I spent all my life without being able to meet our brothers, my brothers, I mean, since now I'm 53 years old, so 46 years I'm away from my brothers. So I don't have anything in common with them. I know that they are there. Sometimes we talk via internet, Skype, telephone, but sure, so you start to lose your, your feelings towards them. I mean, Three, the three of them, one of them had a business in Damascus, he used to work in Damascus, and the other one was in the Syrian army, so he stayed there, and the third one was at the university. And no one expected, I mean, uh, this long-term occupation, every one of us, we thought that it was a question of uh, days, weeks, and uh, Gulam will be again as a part of uh, Syria. But surely, I mean, uh, uh, no one thought at that time that it's, it's going to stay this uh, very long time. I hope that uh, uh, after a while that we really will face different Middle East with more democratic systems. I, I hope that also the Arabs will get enough power after all these changes, which mean that uh, uh, the possibility of enforcing Israel to accept peace will be more. And sure, this will affect our uh, future uh, situation with, with water. Uh, I hope that uh, if Gulen will be again as a part of uh, Syria, uh, which means that after all the accident that's happening now and after all the fighting in Syria, I hope that we'll be able to reach peace and Golan will be given back to Syria. I think that at that time we can uh, get more water from, from, uh, from Golan, which means that the Israeli settlers will not be in Golan and they will not control our, our water. But this is, it's, it's maybe a long-term uh, dream. Uh, at the uh, short short term, I hope that, uh, as I said, that we're not facing uh, another uh, war in the Middle East. I'm sure if, the, if there will be any war in the Middle East, it will affect uh, our uh, water, and surely the, everything is, is uncertain. But anyway, I mean, we have uh, a plan uh, how we really we, we can get more water from our water resources in the near future. I hope if, the, if this plan will be implemented by the year 2015-16, we will be able to uh, get enough uh, water for our irrigation. But surely this is, uh, all of it is between the hands of the Israelis uh, and between the Israeli Water Authority. They, they, they can decide and they are the one who are controlling all these uh, plans. But it seems that really we, we will be able to get uh, uh, more water by the year 2015-2016.